Hi, uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about the Brugada criteria for ventricular tachycardia or VT. Now, ventricular tachycardia can be quite difficult to diagnose from the conventional ECG. Uh, so uh, we use the Brugada criteria, which is um, a very highly sensitive and specific. Its sensitivity can be as high as uh, 98%. And the specificity, sometimes it can be as high as 97%, uh, which is fantastic. So we can rule in and rule out with the Brugada criteria. So over the next few minutes, um, we will talk about Brugada criteria. And uh, at the end of this video, you will have a very good understanding about uh, Brugada criteria, and you can use these tools for the diagnosis of VT. So. Uh, let's uh, set up some goals. So over the next few minutes, we'll talk about uh, the ventricular tachycardia, uh, which is a type of uh, white complex tachycardia. We'll talk about uh, the Brugada criteria, what they are, how to interpret them. Um, of course, uh, uh, after the diagnosis of VT, we'll uh, touch base on the main goals, main uh, diagnostic uh, and uh, management options. Um, there are some of the um, controversies with regards to Brugada criteria, and we will talk about that as well. So, um, broad complex tachycardia, it is a very complicated topic. We'll try to keep it as simple as possible. So, let me uh, show you one of the ECGs of a patient that we have seen a few months ago. So, this was the patient, 72-year-old, um, who came with uh, palpitation. And uh, as you can see in this ECG that uh, there is um, white QRS complexes and they are pretty regular. The ventricular rate is about, um, about 200 bits per minute. And um, there is a bit of right one reverse uh, block as well. Um, so we have uh, tried to diagnose what it is on the basis of ECG and the patient characteristics as well. And uh, we found that um, this patient has got a VT and we treated as SARS. Patient ended up having one um, pacemaker, AICD, um, and he's doing well. So uh, let's talk about uh, the uh, white complex tachycardia. So any uh, QRS uh, complex which is more than 100 milliseconds is considered as um, white complex. And if the ventricular rate is more than 110 bits per minute, we call it uh, a VT or white complex tachycardia, which is regular. Of course, 80% of the white complex tachycardia is actually VT. So when we talk about white complex tachycardia, mostly we talk about VT. Now, white complex um, uh, QRS, uh, usually it happens because the origin of the QRS is in the ventricles. And it is multifactorial. The problem mostly is in the heart, but there are some other conditions like some toxicological cases or uh, metabolic cases like hyperkalemia they can also give rise to the white complex tachycardia. Now, let's uh, focus on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, various types of uh, tachycardia. There are narrow complex and white complex. So in case of white complex, there can be regular and irregular. So usually we talk about 80% of the cases of the white complex tachycardia is VT, but also it can be SVT with aberrant conduction. There can be ventricular pacing. There can be uh, ulcer Parkinson white syndrome with the antidromic conduction. And of course, there can be some medications uh, like uh, tricyclic antipresent and electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia, they can cause this as well. In case of AVRT, patient can have antidromic conduction that can give you uh, the regular uh, tachycardia. In case of irregular tachycardia, the main uh, things that we find is either it is an atrial fibrillation um, with apparent conduction or there can be atrial fibrillation with uh, anti-grade uh, conduction through the accessory pathway that can happen. The patient has got ulcer Parkinson White syndrome. Of course, patient can have polymorphic VT or torsades if the patient has got prolonged QDC. Ventricular fibrillation and antidromic AVRT that uh, also is considered uh, some of the irregular tachycardias. Now, without uh, getting into further details on these uh, various topics, I've got a different video for that. Uh, let's move to the diagnostic approach uh, straight away. So there are different things that we can do for the diagnosis. Now, with regards to the ECG criteria, we'll focus on certain specific things. So let's get oriented with the uh, diagrams. So this is the heart. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle here. This is the left, left atrium is here, and this is the left ventricle. 
this is the ascending avatar and uh, this is the superior vena cava this is the inferior vena cava with regards to the conduction system we have got the SA node here which is the pacemaker uh, it is generating cardiac impulse and that goes through these interatrial pathways through the to the AV node now AV node itself has got some refractory period so all the cardiac impulses cannot straight away go to the ventricles AV node works as a gatekeeper so that it controls the passage of the cardiac impulses from the atria into the ventricles so from the atrioventricular node it goes to the atrioventricular bundle or bundle of ease then it goes to the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch and the Purkinje fibers and cardiac muscle so normally the SA node is producing cardiac impulse it goes through the conduction system and we get a nice uh, narrow QRS complex however in case of the VT the problem happens is that the cardiac impulse is generated in the ventricle it may be here it may be here it may be here and then there is usually a single focus that is why it's called monomorphic ventricular tachycardia when it generates it remains within the ventricle it does not go to the atria so there is a little bit of what we call atrioventricular dissociation the atrial activity it remains within the atria and the ventricular activity remains within the ventricle there is no association between the atrial activity and ventricular activity this is something called atrioventricular dissociation which is um, sorry about the spelling mistake there will be an o there um, so atrioventricular dissociation is very specific for the um, ventricular tachycardia now let's uh, get into the animation now as you can see here the atrial activity it remains mostly in the atria but sometimes it actually manages to go to the ventricle and that is when we get this something called the um, capture bit there is a capture bit so there is a p wave followed by a qrs complex which is narrow complex p wave followed by a qrs complex with a narrow complex so these are capture bits which is the this wave here it is going to the ventricle and the qrs complex is normal qrs complex if you carefully look at it the cardiac impulse which is coming from the atria to the ventricle and the cardiac activity which is going from the ventricle towards the um, upper part of the interventricular septum they actually fuse together and then we get a qrs complex which is a little broader than the normal qrs complex this is called the fusion bit and these are the ventricular ectopics as uh, sorry not ventricular ectopics, these are the ventricular tachycardias they are coming at a rate of about 150 bits per minute and they have got pretty good concordance as well because we cannot identify the r wave or s wave here now this is the classic presentation a few things here are important number one no relationship between the atrial activity and ventricular activity number two there can be some capture bit and there can be some fusion bit if these are present this is very diagnostic of uh, ventricular tachycardia now let's uh, show you some of the more uh, ecgs so this is uh, lead v1 and this is in v5 if you carefully look at it this is white qrs complex this is coming at a rate of about 160 to 170 bits per minute pretty regular there is a little notch here which is actually the p wave there is another p wave here there is another p wave here there is another p wave here another p wave here there is no relationship between the p wave and the qrs complex so that is classic atrioventricular dissociation and if there is atrioventricular dissociation with a white complex type area this is vt until proven otherwise another good example here there are actually two different types of uh, things going on here that is a p wave followed by a qrs complex there is a p wave followed by a qrs complex and pn interval that is pretty regular pretty symmetrical on both sides so this is a uh, capture bit this is a capture bit and uh, these are the ventricular uh, tachycardia but again the p wave and qrs complex do not have any association uh, with each other so that is atrioventricular dissociation here and um, these are the capture bits. so this patient has got a vt now second important thing that we look at for the diagnosis of a vt is the axis northwest axis so let's get oriented with this picture at first so this is the heart 
And if we consider zero degree in the center of the heart, the uh, zero degree will be on this direction here. And then if we go clockwise, we will find that the 90 degree will be at AVF. And then there is 180 degree. And if we go this direction, that is AVR. If we go this direction, that is uh, 270 degree. Minus 30 degree, that will be AVL. Any cardiac activity which goes towards the lead one will get a positive reflection. If the cardiac activity goes towards the AVF, we'll get a positive reflection here. And at the same time, we will get negative reflection in lead one if the cardiac activity goes this direction. If the cardiac activity goes in this direction, we'll get a negative uh, deflection in case of AVF. So by looking at lead one and AVF, we can actually measure the axis. So this is how the whole 360 degree uh, is completed. Now, very specific thing with the, uh, with the um, ventricular tachycardia is the northwest axis or extreme uh, axis deviation. So basically any cardiac axis, which is between 180 degree and 270 degree, that is called northwest axis. Now, as you can realize that if the cardiac impulse is generated here near the apex in ventricular tachycardia, mostly it will go in this direction, which means in AVR, there will be positive deflection. In lead two, there will be negative deflection. In lead one, there will be a negative deflection. So as you can see, the cardiac impulse is going at a very fast rate from here in this direction, and that is why there is a bit of negative reflection in lead one. Similarly, if we look at AVF, it is going away from AVF, so there is a bit of negative deflection in AVF as well. If we look at uh, the AVR, the cardiac impulse is going towards AVR, so we are not surprised that there is positive deflection in AVR. If we look at lead two, the cardiac impulse is going away from lead two, so there is a negative deflection here. If we look at lead three, Similarly, it will be, a, it predominantly it is negative deflection. So by looking at these uh, mainly two leads, lead one and AVF, if both of them are negative predominantly, this patient has got an axis within here between minus, uh, sorry, between 130 degree to 270 degree, which is northwest axis. So northwest axis is uh, usually we don't see in normal patients, the only time we will find it if the patient has got um, ventricular tachycardia. So very specific finding. Another very important characteristic feature of ventricular tachycardia is the width of the QRS complex. By definition, the QRS complex width, that will be more than 100 milliseconds. But if there is width of the QRS complex more than 160 milliseconds, that is very, very uh, suspicious that it could be VT. It can be something else, it can be hyperkalemia or toxicology, but usually the rate, ventricular rate should be uh, less. In case of uh, VT, in this patient, for example, the ventricular rate is uh, almost 150 beats per minute. So this needs to be VT. Now, concordance is a very important concept. Um, concordance of the QRS complex in these chest leads, that is again very specific for diagnosis of a VT. It can be positive complex. Uh, it can be positive upstroke of the QRS complex. So basically positive concordance, or it can be negative concordance. It depends on where the uh, cardiac impulse is generating from. If the cardiac impulse is generating uh, from somewhere at the posterior aspect of the ventricle, then probably it is positive deflection. If it is in the anterior aspect of the ventricle, then it will be negative deflection. So it can be positive concordance or negative concordance. So please don't get confused between concordance of the QRS complex and concordance of the ST segment. In Lepan de Brun's block, for example, if the QRS complex is upstroke, the ST segment will be down. That is concordance, discordance of the ST segment. In Scarborough circuitry, we talk about concordance of the ST segment. But here in the VT, we are talking about concordance of the QRS complexes, which is completely different. Another important characteristic feature is the Brugada sign. This is a part of the Brugada criteria. So Brugada sign is from the beginning of the R wave 
to the nadir of the S-wave. If this distance is more than 2.5 smaller square, which is 100 millisecond, this is Brugada sign. So this is the, uh, in the Brugada algorithm, this is a number two uh, characteristic feature. Uh, so in this uh, particular uh, ECG, we are finding two things. One is a Brugada sign. So from beginning of the Q QRS complex to the nadir of the S-wave, here there is a distance of about one, two, three, so 120 millisecond. Now, if you look at the downsloping part of the S wave, there is a little bit of a notch here. There is a bit of a notch. There is a bit of a notch. This is called Josephson sign. And this Josephson sign is also very, very specific with regards to the um, diagnosis of uh, VT. Now, I can't see any rabbit in this particular ECG. What I can see is there is um, a cardiac impulse which is generated probably from the left side of the heart and it is giving rise to the appearance of a bit of a right Bundermas block appearance in the QRS complexes in the V1 lead. So because it is right Bundermas block, there is uh, an upstroke followed by a little notch there and there is a bit of downstroke. Now, someone with a lot of um, imagination may think of a rabbit here and here we go. So this is a rabbit which has got a left rabbit here is little taller than the right. And I don't know how to correlate with this rabbit with the uh, QRS complexes in the V1. But in the literature, it's called the rabbit ear. Left rabbit ear taller, this is VT. Right rabbit ear taller, that is probably SVT with right Bernabras block. Now, the main topic today is the Brugada criteria. It has got a very high sensitivity 98% and a specificity of 97%. So we can rule out and we can rule in uh, VT on the basis of the uh, Brugada criteria. However, there are about 15 different studies so far on the Brugada criteria and the VT. The sensitivity and the specificity are probably not so high as it was originally um, advocated by the, uh, by the guys who have initially developed Brugada criteria. But still, it is pretty good. Um, so there are four steps. The first step is essentially the concordance. So basically, in this particular ECG, if we look at V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, there is no RS wave. All of the QRS complexes are have got positive concordance. So if this is the baseline here, the QRS complex is wide, and it is above the baseline, above the baseline, and they look pretty much similar. And in V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, similar. So all of them have got positive concordance. If there is a positive concordance or negative concordance from V1 to V6, this is VT. This is nothing else. This is VT. However, if we cannot find the concordance of the QRS complexes from V1 to V6, we go to the next step. And the next step is Brugada sign. We have already talked about Brugada sign. So Brugada sign is, for example, in this particular ECG, if we start from beginning of the QRS complex to the nadir of the S-wave, that will be probably um, uh, four uh, smaller square, which is about 160 millisecond. Anything above 100 millisecond is the Brugada sign. If the Brugada sign is present, that is VT. So in this patient, this is VT. However, if the Brugada sign is absent, then we'll go for the next level. And the next level is the atrioventricular dissociation. I have already shown you uh, some uh, diagrams and some uh, images. Um, in this uh, particular picture, as you can see here, there is a P wave here, P wave here, P wave is buried here, P wave is here, and there is a P wave. So P waves are coming pretty much actually regularly, but there is no relationship or association between the P wave and the QRS complex. So as I have uh, shown you in the previous image, that um, the P wave is doing its activity within the atria and uh, the QRS complex that is doing its activity in the ventricle and they don't have any relationship between them. And that is the very characteristic feature for VT. This is called atrioventricular dissociation. And in this image, as you can see, the atrial activity is in this bubble within the atria and ventricular activities within the ventricle in this bubble and they're maintaining some social distancing between each other. 
sometimes uh, some of the cardiac impulses are managing to go to the ventricle and forming this uh, fusion bit uh, fusion bit here and capture bits here. So this is very characteristic feature for VT. Now, if we do not find the um, uh, atrioventricular dissociation, then we go for the morphological characteristics. Sometimes these morphological characteristics can be a little difficult to interpret, but it is actually not that difficult. Let me uh, make it simple. So, in this particular patient, what we are talking about with these morphological characteristic features is look at V1 and V6. In V1, if you see predominantly R wave, so a only R wave, or there is a big R wave and a small Q wave, or there is a big R wave and a small S wave. So basically the RS ratio, that will be more than one in V1. In V6, the RS ratio will be less than one. If that is the case, this is uh, going to be VT. This is a morphological characteristics. This is a type of morphological characteristic. The other morphological characteristic is the width of the R wave in V1. Um, and um, if it is more than 30 milliseconds, or the uh, from the um, second uh, to the nadir of the S wave, so from here up to here, if the distance is more than 70 millisecond, which is about two small squares, this is um, a classic uh, sub supposed to be a, a VT. In case of the nost or slard S wave, like this one in V1, then that is also supposed to be a VT. So let me summarize Brugada criteria for the diagnosis of VT. There are four steps. In the first step, we look for the presence of concordance of the QRS complexes in the V1 to V6. This is also called the absence of the RS wave. If the RS wave is absent from the precordial leads, we call it concordance. Either it is a positive concordance or a negative concordance. If that is the case, this is VT. If it is absent, then we'll go for the uh, step, uh, step number two, which is Brugada sign. Brugada sign is from the beginning of the R wave to the nadir of the S wave, if the distance is more than 100 millisecond or 2.5 uh, smaller square in a standard ECG, that is VT. If the Brugada sign is absent, we'll go for the step number three, which is atrioventricular dissociation. If the atrioventricular dissociation is present, this is VT. If it is absent, we'll go for the step number four, which is morphological characteristics. There are two types of morphological cr uh, criteria. One is uh, the RS wave in V1, more than one, and RS wave, less than one in V6. The other morphological criteria is the width of the R wave in V1, more than 30 millisecond, or from the beginning of R wave to the S wave, more than 70 millisecond, or there is a slard uh, S wave in the V1. So that, that, that is uh, some morphological criteria. So on the basis of the these different characteristic features, we can uh, do the diagnosis of VT. So when we talk about VT, we are talking about monomorphic VT, and monomorphic VT is that all the QRS complexes look like they are similar. They are same size, same sh shape, same morphology. And um, if this is present in the uh, Precordial leads from V6, so V1 to V6. This is classic presentation of VT. Now let's uh, do some exercise. So this is a patient who is presenting with palpitation, and we are trying to interpret what is wrong with this patient. What we'll do is let's uh, do the um, conventional characteristics and also the Brugada criteria. Now in this particular patient in V1 and V2. It can be a little tricky to identify which one is what, but if you look at the V3, V4, V5, and V6, I cannot identify, I cannot, uh, I cannot demonstrate which one is R wave and which one is S wave. So you can say that they have got negative concordance, which is basically the first criteria of Brugada. Even if you argue that there is a little S R wave here and then followed by a big S wave, let's do the step number two. Step number two is from beginning of R wave to the nadir of this wave, the distance is about uh, three smaller square, which is 120 millisecond. So this is VT. If we consider um, 
the third level that is atrioventricular dissociation i cannot see any r wave so we cannot comment about our atrioventricular dissociation with regards to the morphological pattern again in v1 and v2 i can't uh, comment about the morphological pattern so i think based on the characteristic feature of presence of brugada sign i'll consider it as a vt if we look at the conventional rules then look at the axis the axis here in lead one that is negative axis and avf negative so basically this is a northwest axis which is very very characteristic feature for a vt here in lead three there is a notch in the down sloping part of the krs complex which is called the josephson sign as well as uh, in lead two we have got josephson sign in avf we have got josephson sign these are characteristic features of vt so this patient has got a vt let's look at another patient now if we slowly go through these um, steps uh, in a systematic way then we will find that um, let's do the brugada characteristics so the first characteristic feature is the presence of concordance in v1 there is a, a positive deflection of the krs there is a positive deflection in v2 there is a positive deflection in v3 however in v4 v5 v6 there is negative deflection so the uh, concordance is absent so there is some rs wave especially in v6 for example so we go we'll go to the next step the next step is the brugada sign again if we start from beginning of our wave to the nadir of this wave there are four small squares which is 140 160 milliseconds which means uh, this patient has got a vt and um, i cannot see any p wave so i cannot comment about the atrioventricular dissociation um, the this is rhythm strip which is taken actually after the 12 ecg has been done so uh, don't get confused between the um, this uh, first three rows with the fourth row please so on the basis of the brugada criteria we can consider this as a vt even if we look at the morphological characteristics in v1 there is predominantly r wave and so rs ratio in v1 or v2 is more than one if we look at the v6 r small r divided by big s wave so that is rs ratio is less than one so this is one of the morphological characteristics the other morphological characteristic is width of the r wave here that will be uh, more than uh, it should be at least uh, three smaller square which is 120 millisecond so anything more than 30 uh, millisecond in v1 uh, that is very diagnostic for vt as well so let's look at uh, another patient so as you can see here there is a white complex uh, tachycardia and the ventricular rate is about 150 beats per minute and pretty regular so we have got some options it can be vt it can be svt with aberrant conduction it can be atrial fata with two is to one block with uh, a right benevolence block now let's use the brugada criteria here so at first the first uh, uh, characteristic feature is the um, uh, concordance of the qrs complexes now in v1 that is positive v2 positive v3 probably negative v4 negative v3 v5 five negative and v6 that is negative as well so there is no concordance so we'll go to the uh, step number two the step number two is a brugada sign so from the beginning of the r wave to the nadir of the s wave there should be about three uh, small square which is 120 millisecond um, so that is uh, brugada sign is present so that should be vt I can't see any obvious uh, P waves, so I cannot um, comment about the atrioventricular dissociation in this particular ECG. With regards to the morphological pattern, uh, look at the V1. So the, there is a big R, small S wave. So the RS ratio will be more than one. And in the V6, there's a small R and big S, so the RS ratio will be less than one. This is classic uh, VT. Now let's do another patient. Now it can be quite difficult this one because of uh, the ventricular ectopics and um, there are two different types of ECG. On the left hand side we have got VT. On the right hand side we have some ventricular ectopics followed by some uh, capture bits. Now as we have known from the conventional rule that if there is any capture bit 
this is supposed to, this is uh, this is should be vt now if we look at the uh, morphological pattern because we cannot see uh, the concordance in the uh, v1 to v6 uh, we'll have to go to the characteristic number two which is the brugada sign so in any lead if you consider from the beginning of our wave to the nadir of this wave it's almost 200 milliseconds which is well above the baseline of 100 millisecond for Bugara sign. I cannot see any obvious uh, P wave in this uh, segment, so it could be difficult to demonstrate the atriventricular dissociation. With regards to the morphological pattern, you look at the V1 or V2, the RS ratio is more than one. In uh, V6, I can't comment because there is no, there are some ventricular ectopic, but can be difficult to demonstrate that. Uh, characteristic number four so let's do another one um, so this is another patient who has got um, a white qrs complex and it is regular and um, if we uh, try to under consider the characteristic features of brugada criteria the first criteria is the um, presence of concordance in the precordial leads now, if we look at the QRS complexes in V1, V2, V3, they are predominantly upstroke. But in V4, V5, V6, predominantly there is a downstroke. So there is no concordance. We'll go to the Brugada criteria 2, which is Brugada sign. So from beginning of the R wave to the nadir of the S wave, that is almost 200 millisecond. So this needs to be a VT. Um, I can't see any obvious P wave, so it will be difficult to comment about the atrioventricular dissociation. But if we look at the morphological characteristics, in V1, there is RS ratio is more than one. So there's a big R wave followed by a small S wave. And if we look at the V6, there is a small R wave followed by a big S wave. So the RS ratio is less than one. So this is one of the morphological characteristics of VT. So on the, base of, on the basis of the um, Brugada criteria and conventional criteria, we can diagnose VT pretty confidently now. Now, let me summarize the management. Once we uh, do the diagnosis, we can divide these patients into three broad categories. One is a cardiac arrest. And in this case, we need to follow the ALS uh, protocol. If there is no palpable pulse, we will uh, give a unsynchronized DC cardioversion with uh, 200 joule and follow the uh, protocol to the CPR every two minutes. In, if the patient is unstable, then we can do synchronized uh, DC cardioversion uh, follow, following a uh, sedation. Now, this will be very clear what is unstable, what is unstable uh, meaning. Unstable meaning four things. Either the patient has got a situation blood pressure below 90 millimeter mercury, or there is chest pain or acute coronary syndrome, or there is reduced level of consciousness, or uh, there is pulmonary edema or left ventricular failure. If any of those four characteristic features are present, we call this unstable um, uh, VT. And the patient is treated with synchronized DC cardioversion. They will need sedation and they will need some analgesia. The third category of patient is stable patient. They are awake. They, are, they can communicate, they have got normal blood pressure, no acute coronary syndrome, no chest pain, normal GCS, and uh, they don't have pulmonary edema either. So these are the stable patients. We can treat them with chemical cardioversion, such as amiodarone, procainamide. There are a lot of different options. In any of the cases, we need to consider the cause and treat that cause. For example, if the patient has got acute coronary syndrome or MI, they need to go to CAT lab for catheterization, or they might have to have a stenting. So that is the main uh, uh, treatment option in case of the VT, cardiac arrest, unstable patient, and unstable patient. So there are some controversy with regards to the um, uh, Brugada criteria. Uh, there are some of the clinicians who feel that the Brugada criteria probably is not good enough. There is a recent paper which is uh, published in 2018. It's a meta-analysis on the basis of the uh, Brugada criteria applicability in the broad complex tachycardia, mainly in case of the VT. And the authors found that um, out of the two th almost 2,000 ECGs in 13 different studies, 
The sensitivity is pretty good with regards to the Brugada criteria, 92%. So we can rule out VT if the Brugada criteria are not fulfilled. However, the specificity is only 71%, which means there is a moderate uh, specificity. So we can probably rule in with Brugada criteria, but we'll be more comfortable in ruling out uh, VT on the basis of uh, the Brugada criteria. The authors suggested that the Brugada criteria are excellent um, tool for the diagnosis of the uh, VT and to differentiate VT from SVT. So uh, the uh, Brugada criteria can be quite complicated, but if we practice this uh, once again and again and again on real life and in patients and in the ECGs, it does not uh, feel like that complicated. Uh, there are only four steps, and if we use these four steps, and of course we need to consider what are the underlying different conditions, and many of the patients are admitted to cardiology for AICD, depending on what the underlying conditions are. Now let me summarize the whole uh, topic. So obviously we need to consider the demographic characteristics of the patient, uh, below 35 or above 35, underlying cardiac disease, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy. With regards to the ECG criteria, we have talked about the um, conventional rules like uh, presence of fusion bit, capture bit, uh, the atrioventricular dissociation, white QRS complex, northwest axis, concordance of the QRS complexes, and the presence of the uh, left taller reviteer in V1. Uh, that is conventional ECG criteria for VT. With regards to the Brugada criteria itself, there are four steps. First criteria is look at the concordance in V1 to V6. If that is present, this is VT. If the concordance is absent, then look for the Brugada sign, which is from the beginning of our wave to the nadir of this wave, if it is more than 100 millisecond, this is Brugada sign, this is VT. If not, go through the step number three, which is atrioventricular dissociation. If atrioventricular dissociation is present, this is VT. If atrioventricular dissociation is absent, then we'll go for the level four or step number four, which is the morphological characteristics. One of the morphological characteristics is V1, RS ratio more than one, and V6, RS ratio less than one. The other morphological characteristic is width of the R wave in V1 more than 30 millisecond, um, or there is a slurred nost S wave in V1. Of course, in case of the white complex take area, always think about toxicology like uh, trisic antidepressant, carbamazepine, propranolol. They are not VT, they are VT mimics. In case of hyperkalemia, they can also cause white complex take area. And we need to be very careful before we give treatment. If we give amiodarone in a patient who has got trisic antidepressant overdose or hyperkalemia, they can develop VF and can eventually die. So we need to be very careful about that. In any uh, uh, white complex criteria or VT, whether we use the Brugada criteria or other conventional criteria, we need to try to identify the cause of it. Is it myocardial ischemia? Is it electrolyte abnormality? Is it cardiomyopathy? Depending on the cause, the appropriate treatment should be provided. So there is some very good articles in uh, UpToDate and also Ed Burns have got uh, fantastic uh, resources in Life in the Fast Lane. Uh, so they can be used for uh, further references. If you've got any further questions, please uh, drop me a line. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much for watching and um, I'll see you soon. Bye for now.